As I headed to the theater on opening night, this was the conversation I had with myself. This is going to be amazing, Alex. I know it will. Because I don't know what I'm going to do if it's not. Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker is the last film in the Star Wars sequel trilogy and the final film in the saga, for now at least, no franchise is ever really gone. One year after the Force took Luke Skywalker away, the Resistance is still facing the First Order, and Rey is continuing her Jedi training under the supervision of Leia. Both sides are now looking for the origin of a message sent out to the galaxy coming from the voice of the Sith Master, Emperor Palpatine, who has been dead for over 30 years. And that's really all I can say without revealing anything that the trailers haven't. This is a spoiler-free review. I am a huge Star Wars fan. I have been for the last 15 years of my life, and I have been into the new sequel trilogy. I know there are those who lost all interest after The Last Jedi, but as someone who loved The Force Awakens and loved aspects of The Last Jedi, the conclusion to this trilogy was a big deal to me. As I said I would, I have seen the movie twice now. The first time it was at a screening hosted by my old youth group leader Ryan, who is the single biggest Star Wars fan that I know personally. And the second time I went with one of my viewers, Jake Reel, after meeting him for the first time. Thanks for watching, Jake. So after those two viewings, I have my thoughts together on the end of the Skywalker saga, and what was the prediction I made at the beginning of my review for A New Hope? How great it will be to be alive to witness the end of the saga as the world is seeing it for the first time. Mm, mm yeah, yeah, kinda. Alright, before you feel bad for me, I was not broken hearted by this movie, just underwhelmed. For the final film in such a big saga, I feel that it needed more, and in some areas, less. I will say, I got hooked by the first five minutes. This beginning is hair-raising with its dark lighting and ambience, and the sound of some familiar voices. Even the way that the opening crawl phrases some sentences is spine-tingling. As the movie goes on, however, it feels less preponderant. The next 90 minutes or so are spent with the characters searching for several MacGuffins, which makes it feel more like a video game movie and less like a war movie. And that's a big misstep for a movie that's part of a series called Star Wars. Though after being separated for most of Episodes 7 and 8, it was nice to see Ray, Finn, and Poe on adventure together, and their chemistry scores a number of laughs. The connection with Ray and Kylo Ren was one of the things that carried The Last Jedi, and it's still engaging here, with the acting from Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver continuing to knock it out of the park. With the untimely death of Carrie Fisher, a role for Leia was constructed from footage drawn from deleted scenes from The Force Awakens. I don't know how they pulled it off, but that footage is woven into the story and scenery with unobtrusive results. There is an abrupt end to her story, but I can cut him some slack on that one since they only had so much to work with. And unlike The Last Jedi with its futile subplot on Canobite, The Rise of Skywalker mostly stays focused and doesn't deviate from its point just for some commentary on animal rights. And if you're someone who thinks that Rose Tico was the worst Star Wars character, that's one less thing you'll have to worry about here. She's on screen very occasionally in this movie. Though it's hard to know what detractors of The Last Jedi are going to think overall. They might appreciate how it reverses some things that Episode Eight established, or it might be too late for them to care. While I thought The Last Jedi was decent, I was fine with the direction this movie takes, but the ways that it tries to reverse some things come off rather cumbersome. There's a reveal midway through the film that could have easily been written in such a way that it wouldn't feel like just a blatant retcon, but that is what it feels like. As you see in the marketing, Kylo Ren reforges his helmet early in the movie for reasons you can probably guess, and at this point, I feel that his helmet joins Vader's as an iconic object in this franchise. The new fractured appearance of it is a mirror of his history. He's an imitator of Vader who is constantly shaken by the light, as made clear by a line from Rey when she and Ren are facing each other. I see through the cracks in your mask. You're still haunted by what you did to your father. It has less of an effect, though, because throughout the movie, sometimes he'll have it on and sometimes he won't. Aside from when he reassembles the mask, there's no pattern as to whether he has it on or not. As for the inclusion of the Emperor, I think it's possible that J.J. Abrams might have had this in mind since the beginning, but it wasn't in any of Lucasfilm's official plans. And this shows in the fact that the Emperor wasn't in Colin Trevorrow's script when he was hired as writer and director for Episode 9. 
Abrams explained that he saw it as necessary for the Emperor to be in the movie to make all three trilogies feel like one single story. And watching the movie, I saw what he was going for. It does go a little beyond just, whoa, the Emperor's back. Let's kill him properly this time. I do think that it works to an extent. I just wish that there was a more evident setup for it in the previous film. There are also other plot points in this movie that feel like Abrams had intended them for Episode Eight. There's a new character named Janna who leads a group of First Order deserters like Finn, so he finds a connection with them, but that's just glossed over. And the Knights of Ren are in the movie. There's nothing interesting done with them, they're just present. It seems that when Abrams passed the reins to Ryan Johnson, he was like, eh, I'm just going to make the Star Wars movie I want to make. And then when Abrams returned, he had to bullet point some things like the Knights of Ren and the former Stormtroopers. And this all sums up the biggest problem with these three movies together as one narrative. When you see this one, it becomes obvious that there was no clear vision for the trilogy as a whole. Abrams did make it clear that he understood that bringing an end to the trilogy as well as the saga was no small matter. He and other people involved made certain promises that would make this movie feel worthy as the final chapter, but not all of them are fulfilled. For example, John Williams said that every major Star Wars theme from the past films would be featured. The ones that are used here are incorporated very well, but I was disappointed that Duel of the Fates was never used, even though it was featured in some of the TV spots. And J.J. Abrams said that this movie would answer as many questions raised by The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi as possible. I never expected Episode Eight to answer every question. Heck, I wasn't even upset that Snoke died before we knew anything about him. But because this was the last one, I was counting on it to answer every question. And while most of them are, one glaring question is still left lingering. How did Maz Kanata get Luke's lightsaber? In The Force Awakens, Han asked this, and Maz replied, A good question, for another time. You're seriously going to ask the question yourselves, only to never explain? The biggest rip-off of all is the one thing that I absolutely hated about this movie. You might think, as I did from the last trailer, that something very meaningful was going on with C-3PO that might give the character closure or something along those lines. For now, I'm just going to say, set your expectations very low. The sets and visuals are state-of-the-art, as anyone knows to expect, but the action is not as impressive as the last two installments. The best action sequence is a lightsaber duel between Rey and Kylo Ren while they're standing in completely different places, the audience's perspective shifts between both locations as they fight by means of that force connection that Snoke gave them in the last movie. There's also an okay chase scene on the desert planet Pisana. When we got glimpses of the final battle where a handful of resistance ships go up against a mammoth fleet of Star Destroyers flooding the screen, I thought to myself, holy cow, that is going to be something else. This has to be the weakest final battle in the whole series. It reaches for such a huge scale that it loses coherence. You don't have a sense for how much progress the heroes are making. The resolution to everything, however, is executed great. The way that it honors the Jedi legacy feels so right, and it truly does signify Luke's words, no one's ever really gone. Despite such a great ending and all of the other redeeming qualities, this is still one of my least favorite Star Wars movies. It makes kind of a mess out of the sequel trilogy, it's overstuffed, it has less of a war movie feel, and some of the action is lackluster. I would have loved nothing more than to be able to praise the heck out of this movie, but as the finale to one of the greatest fantasy stories ever known, it should have been more than just okay. After carefully considering all of the factors that determine my score for a movie, I've landed on a 60% for Star Wars Episode IX, The Rise of Skywalker. So sadly, I couldn't show up on camera here as excited as I wanted to be. But hey, don't take my word for it. Go check it out and decide for yourselves. My youth group leader who hosted the screening absolutely loved it, and it seems that most of the crowd there are left happy too. And that made me smile, despite my personal split feelings toward the movie. That's a wrap. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this review helpful. And be sure to stick around for my spoiler review of the movie. Like and share. Subscribe for more. This is Pop Culture. I'm Alex Pop, and may the Force be with you.